Let's read, uh, brethren, from Luke 24. Read the uh, first 35 verses. Our text is taken from the verses 33 and 34 of this uh, section of God's Word. This, of course, is the very last chapter of the book of Luke, and uh, it comes after the uh, the uh, actual crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ and deals uh, with some of the events that relate to uh, the resurrection. Now, upon the first day of the week, early, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. It came to pass, as they were much perplexed there, there, thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulchre and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulchre, and stooping down he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score, three score, three score furlongs and they talked together of all these things which had happened and it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned Jesus himself drew near and went with them but their eyes were holden that they should not know him and he said unto them what manner of communication are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad and the one of them whose name was Cleopas answering said unto him Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel, And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it even even so as the women had said. But him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave, it to, gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together with them that were with them. 
saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. And the Lord bless to us uh, his word, and particularly as we come to uh, focus this evening on verses 33 and 34. We're told there, and they rose up the same hour, speaking there of the uh, two men uh, who had uh, walked from Jerusalem uh, to Emmaus on that Sunday afternoon. And they rose up that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. The Lord is risen indeed. That were the words of unbounded joy that greeted the two men from Emmaus when they returned to Jerusalem on that Sunday evening. Late in the afternoon of that same day, those two men had left Jerusalem in a state of confusion and uncertainty and they were they returned to their home in Emmaus uh, which was about 10 kilometres away from Jerusalem. And as they walked together, as we read there in Luke 24, they spoke about the events that had taken place in Jerusalem over the preceding few days. Uh, and those events, of course, had involved uh, the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. And as these men are walking along the way to Emmaus, they're joined by a stranger. The stranger, though he initially appeared to have little knowledge of what had happened in Jerusalem during the preceding few days, eventually in fact revealed that he had a depth of understanding of what had taken place in Jerusalem. In fact, a depth of understanding of those events that far exceeded uh, the understanding of the two men on the road. As the men walked and talked with this stranger, he opened to them the Old Testament scriptures. And from those Old Testament scriptures, he explained to them what had occurred in Jerusalem over the previous few days. He explained to them the significance of the cross and he explained to them also the necessity of the resurrection. And finally, when he sat down with them for a meal uh, and by the manner in fact which he actually uh, took the bread and blessed it and broke it, he revealed to them that he was the risen Christ. And as soon as he had done that, we are told that he vanished out of their sight. This meeting with the risen Christ led these two men, despite the lateness of the hour and no doubt the weariness that they felt to retrace their steps that very same evening to Jerusalem. Their fellow disciples in Jerusalem needed to know what they had seen. They needed to know that Jesus was alive. They needed to know that he had risen from the dead. Rumours to that effect had been circulating around Jerusalem all day, but now these men had proof. They had seen Jesus, they had spoken to him, and they'd even eaten a meal with him. Jesus was alive. Such thrilling news could not wait until the following day. And so these two men, despite the lateness of the hour, they returned to Jerusalem that Sunday night. But interestingly, when they came to the place where the other disciples were gathered together in Jerusalem, before they could even utter a word, their fellow disciples greeted them with the very news that they had, that they had come to convey to them. And so we have those words, the Lord is risen indeed. And moreover, they told them that he had also appeared to Simon. Now those words were the spontaneous, joyous words of the disciples of Jesus. The Lord whom they thought was, a dead, was, in, was dead was in fact alive. Uh, he had risen from the dead. Uh, the word indeed, uh, he is risen indeed, indeed reflects the sense of relief and jubilation that the news occasioned among the disciples. All their anxieties their fears and their worries have been swallowed up in the certain knowledge of the resurrection. It was no longer a rumour. They were assured that Jesus had risen from the dead. The words the Lord had risen or the Lord is risen indeed 
really point back to the uh, confusion and uncertainty that had prevailed among the disciples of Jesus throughout the course of that day. When the two men on, uh, travelled to Emmaus had set out on the road uh, earlier that afternoon, there had been much speculation about the possibility that Jesus had risen from the dead. But in the minds of those men and the minds of many others in Jerusalem, that was purely speculative thinking. But now the disciples in Jerusalem were convinced. The knowledge of the resurrection, in fact, thrilled the hearts of the disciples there. Uh, and it's not difficult, really, is it, to understand why the knowledge that Jesus had risen from the dead ought also to thrill our hearts. Indeed, it should be a matter of delight and relief for every believer. Why is that? Well, because the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is the assurance and the seal upon our own salvation. It's confirmation not only of our own bodily resurrection, but it's confirmation of our place in glory. The knowledge and certainty of the resurrection ought to engender consequently within us a real sense of joy. As believers, we should rejoice in the knowledge that the Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. And moreover, it should be a matter of enormous encouragement and comfort to us also that he revealed himself unto Simon. So I want to look at this word of God this afternoon under this theme, the Lord is risen indeed. We look firstly at the attested fact then the gracious revelation and then finally the rightful joy. Our text brings us to the evening of the first day of the week following the crucifixion of Jesus on the previous Friday. All day from earliest morning, information had been circulating throughout Jerusalem that suggested the unthinkable. And the unthinkable was that Jesus had risen from the dead. Such a prospect had raised a glimmer of hope within the hearts of the disciples. The evidence that this might actually be true had been steadily building throughout the course of the first day of the week. And now the possibility had transformed into an assured confidence that Jesus had risen from the dead was no longer a matter of mere conjecture or speculation. It had become a certain truth in the minds of the disciples gathered there in Jerusalem. The Lord is risen indeed. The confusion, anxiety and uncertainty that had enveloped the minds of many of the disciples over the preceding two days had been swallowed up in the certainty of Jesus' resurrection. As that Sunday, the first day of the week, had dawned, Jesus' disciples had not seriously entertained the possibility that he would in fact rise from the dead. Uh, They did not seriously entertain that possibility, even though Jesus had told them prior to his crucifixion that that is exactly what he would do. In the hurt, the sadness and the confusion of the previous two days, uh, Jesus' prophetic words concerning his resurrection had been lost upon his disciples. Therefore, when the women among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, Salome, Joanna, and those women had gone early that same morning to the uh, sepulchre of Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, They went simply with the purpose of anointing the body of Jesus and they went at that time with a sense of deep sadness and sorrow. They went to the sepulchre simply to complete the preparation of Jesus' body for burial. Uh, That needed to be done because the previous Friday when they had begun that process, they had been unable to complete the preparation of his body for its internment. As the women had come to the sepulchre that morning, they had not entertained the thought that Jesus might in fact have risen from the dead. That was the furthest thing from the mind of these women. They were simply coming to anoint his body out of love and respect for him. Therefore, it had been a sombre group of women that had come at first light to the sepulchre that Sunday morning. But what the women reported concerning what they saw and heard 
at the sepulchre when they arrived engendered wonder and amazement, but also disbelief among the disciples in Jerusalem. What did the women report? Well, the women reported that the Roman soldiers that had been appointed to guard the sepulchre were no longer there. Uh, furthermore, they also reported that the heavy stone that had covered the entrance to the sepulchre had been rolled away. The sepulchre itself, they uh, reported, was empty, though the grave clothes in which Jesus' body had been wrapped the previous Friday uh, still remained, and they remained, in fact, undisturbed. The women also reported speaking to angels, angels who reportedly had asked, Why seek ye the living among the dead? And who had then gone on to say, He, referring to Jesus, is not here, but is risen. And as that first day of the week had unfolded, other reports concerning the resurrection of Jesus, some supportive, some contradictory, had also circulated in Jerusalem. Rumour had it that the Roman soldiers had fled because of strange happenings at the sepulchre earlier that morning. Unexplained events had, that had involved the appearance of angels and earthquakes uh, had caused them to flee. But these rumours had also been contradicted by a story that suggested that the body of Jesus had been stolen by his disciples while those soldiers slept. There were also reports by Peter and John of what they had observed at the sepulchre when they had rushed there, having heard the report by the women who had gone to anoint the body of Jesus. Indeed, all day Jerusalem, it would appear, was a buzz uh, with all of these reports. And by early that evening, despite reported sightings of Jesus, the view that Jesus had risen from the dead had reached really no higher acceptance among the disciples than that of conjecture. That was evident uh, from the discussion that ensued between the two men as they made their way back uh, to Emmaus from Jerusalem. Those men uh, undertook that journey, uh, we are told, late in the afternoon of that Sunday. And as appears from Luke 24, those two men were actually perplexed they did not know what to believe or what to make of what they had heard in Jerusalem. They knew that Jesus of Nazareth was a prophet of God, mighty in word and in actions. Yet their rulers had condemned him, had put him to death, they crucified him. Why was that? They could not understand why that had occurred. They saw no logic, no purpose in the cross. Indeed, they had no explanation really for those events. The things that had occurred really made no sense to these men. These men, like many others, uh, had in fact fixed their hope on Jesus as the one whom they anticipated would be the deliverer of Israel. In fact, they believed that he was the promised Messiah. Therefore, they were at a loss to understand how and why he had been crucified. As they made their way home to Emmaus, these men had spoken at length about all of these things. They even analysed the astonishing reports of the women who had gone to the sepulchre earlier that morning. You read in verse 22 of uh, Luke 24, Yea, and certain women, they said, also of our company, as they speak to the stranger, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. Uh, you find also that they also mentioned the visit of Peter and John uh, to uh, the uh, sepulchre that's found also in verse 24. But now late that Sunday evening as the two men from Emmaus uh, returned to Jerusalem, the understanding of the disciples in Jerusalem has altered dramatically. The resurrection of Jesus was no longer a matter of mere speculation and conjecture. It was an accepted fact. The Lord is risen indeed. This was a position the disciples in Jerusalem had not come to easily when the prospect of Jesus' resurrection uh, had initially been raised by the report of the women who had attended at the sepulchre. There had been a great deal of scepticism about uh, whether what they had reported was true. 
Indeed, some, even among the 11 uh, disciples, some, in fact, had refused to believe. You might recall that Thomas refused to believe. Thomas said, except I shall see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And Thomas was not alone. Uh, we read that when the eleven and the other disciples heard from the women that Jesus had risen from the dead, they too had not believed. You find that in Luke 24, 9 through 11. And the women returned from the sepulchre and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. And then we read, And their words seemed to them as idle or empty tales, and they believed them not. Mark in his gospel reveals that even after the two men from Emmaus had returned to Jerusalem and reported that they had met with the risen Christ, they also were not believed by some in Jerusalem. We read in Mark 16, 13, after that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Why was it such a struggle for the followers of Jesus to embrace the reality of the resurrection? Put yourself, brethren, in their place. The disciples who witnessed the death of Jesus, it was painfully real to them. They had seen him nailed to the cross. They had seen his life ebb away. They had seen him hang there on the cross for some six hours and then that some had even heard him say, it is finished, and then he had actually committed his spirit into the hands of his heavenly Father. Some of them had also seen the removal of his body from the cross and the placing of his body in the sepulchre of Joseph of Arimathea. Others among them had also assisted in the anointing of his body. There was no question in the mind of the disciples that Jesus was dead. They had not expected him to die. They had not wanted him to die. But he had died, and they knew it. So naturally for them to accept that he had risen from the dead was a difficult thing. It be as difficult as if we were confronted with the prospect that someone were to rise from the dead. And furthermore... When you think about it, the cross itself made no sense to the disciples. Uh, they'd fixed their hope upon Jesus, but now he's dead. And with the death of Jesus, so also went their hopes. They were left disillusioned and confused by the events of the previous Friday. Everything had occurred uh, so quickly on that previous Friday. Just think about that. On the Thursday evening, uh, the disciples had celebrated the Passover in Jerusalem and within 24 hours of them celebrating the Passover in Jerusalem, Jesus was dead. He'd been tried and convicted by the Sanhedrin and had been executed by order of the Roman authorities. The enormity of what had occurred left his followers overwhelmed with emotion and grief. And so to contemplate that Jesus might rise from the dead was really beyond their wildest imaginations. Now the disciples struggled with the possibility. As the day, as that Sunday had progressed, they had been confronted by a growing weight of evidence. The evidence had increasingly become uh, compelling, perhaps one might even say overwhelming. And it was difficult for the disciples not to accept the evidence relating to Jesus' resurrection because much of the evidence was actually coming from those whom they knew and trusted. And furthermore, it was evidence some of which, at least, they could verify with their own eyes. There were, of course, the reports of the women of what had taken place at the sepulchre. 
There was the evidence of the stone rolled away, the empty tomb, the grave closed. There was the confirmation of many of those things by Peter and John. And then there were the reports of what the angels themselves had said, how that Jesus had risen from the dead. But more startling and even more confronting had been the eyewitness accounts. Uh, There were eyewitness accounts from those who had reportedly seen Jesus. The first of those reports had come from Mary Magdalene as she stood outside the sepulchre weeping. Uh, Though at the time Mary did not recognise Jesus, at that time Jesus said to her, Woman, woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Uh, Mary, supposing uh, Jesus, in fact, to be the gardener, said, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me whence thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And to that, Jesus responded, Mary, Mary. And the light of recognition uh, was switched on in the mind of Mary, because Mary responds, Rabboni, Master. And then there was the account of the other women who had also accompanied Mary to the sepulchre early on that Sunday morning. They too had reportedly seen Jesus as they returned from the sepulchre. You can read of that in Matthew 28 and verse 9. Uh, We read there, uh, As they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, This is the women, Jesus met them, saying, All hail, and we're told, and they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. So these women not only saw him, but they actually uh, took hold of Jesus. And finally, we are told also that on this day, Jesus had appeared unto Simon. Uh, And so finally, the weight of the evidence had to actually tip the scales of acceptance from a strong possibility to an assured confidence. Jesus was alive. At this time, the disciples, though, did not fully grasp the significance of the resurrection. Nonetheless, the knowledge of it brought joy and hope to them. In time, through the outpouring of the Spirit of the risen Christ, The disciples of Jesus, not just the year 12, but all of those that followed him, would in fact come to appreciate more fully the abundant spiritual riches and the profound personal significance of the resurrection for themselves and indeed for every believer. They have come to understand that Jesus' resurrection was not, as some of them anticipated, merely a resumption of his earthly life, a return to the ways of the earlier times, of the uh, times that they had experienced just a few days earlier. That was not the nature they would discover of the resurrection. They would come to grasp that his resurrection was not so that he might once again live and labour among them, nor was it designed so that he might establish the earthly kingdom uh, which many of them were looking for. But they would come to understand that the resurrection involved much more than simply life in this world. They would come to understand that the resurrection was in truth central to their attainment under under the blessings and glory of Jesus Christ. They would discover that the resurrection was in fact fundamental to their salvation and to the bringing to fruition of a heavenly kingdom in which they would have a place. They would come to appreciate that Jesus had come into this world in the likeness of sinful men, having taken upon himself the form of a man that he'd humbled himself and submitted himself to the indignities, the suffering, the rejection and the shame which ultimately led him to the cross. Why did he do that? For their sakes. That's what they would discover, that he'd done all of this for their sakes in order that he might redeem them from their sins, in order that he might drink the cup of God's wrath that was due to them. 
suffering in their stead, suffering on their behalf, making atonement for their sins. And through the life, through his life of perfect obedience, he would uh, justify them in the sight of God. That, of course, brethren, is not only significant to the resurrection for the disciples of Jesus Christ, that's the significant of the resurrection for every believer. The disciples, you see, would come to realise that Jesus Christ had laid down his life in death for them. They were marked for death and he stood in their place. And on account of their sins, uh, he laid down his life. That was the very purpose for which he'd come into the world, that he might uh, take their guilt upon him and that he might bear their sins in his body on that tree of Calvary. But even more than that, they would also come through the work of the Spirit to appreciate and rejoice in the fact that death and the grave could not hold the Son of God. The reality was that Jesus Christ had power over death. His body would not see corruption, but rather he would be victorious over death and the grave, raised to life. And the disciples would eventually come to understand that because he lived, they would live also. And because he was risen from the dead, they too would rise from the dead. They too would enjoy immortality, living eternally in the presence of God. They were going to come to understand the meaning of what Jesus had actually said to Martha on the occasion of Lazarus' death. You might recall that Jesus said this to Martha. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth on me shall never die. Rather than the resurrection was fundamental and essential to the fulfilment of God's plan of salvation for every believer. You and I, by God's grace, have a vital interest in the resurrection. We need, consequently, to believe that the Lord is risen indeed. That's the basis for our comfort and our hope. Jesus Christ did not die and then leave his body and have his body then left in some dusty sepulchre in Palestine. Uh, but rather, the Lord Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. We serve a risen Saviour. We serve a victorious and exalted Saviour who bore our griefs and carried our sorrows and who conquered death and the grave and who now sits enthroned at the right hand of his heavenly Father. By virtue of the resurrection and the subsequent exaltation of Jesus Christ to the right hand of his Father, God the Father actually signifies his acceptance and approval of the work of of his son upon the cross. Through his resurrection, Jesus Christ, in fact, paved the way for us out of death into life. Yes, we will die physically, but just as death could not hold Jesus Christ, nor will death be able to hold you and me. We too, by virtue of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, will actually rise from the dead at the day of Jesus Christ's return. One of the amazing yet extraordinarily encouraging things about the resurrection of Jesus was that he made that fact known personally to Simon. Sometimes a very sweet 
portions of the scriptures come in very uh, short words. And that's here in this passage. The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. That statement reflects a sense of amazement on the part of the disciples. The significance that Jesus had appeared unto Simon was not lost upon the disciples there in Jerusalem. They knew what Simon Peter had done. And therefore, it was noteworthy that Jesus had revealed himself to Simon following his resurrection from the dead. Who would have thought that Jesus would have bothered to reveal himself to Simon? Simon, who had denied him on three occasions, Significantly, the other disciples refer to him here as Simon and not Peter. Simon was Peter's given or natural name. And before he met Jesus, he was simply known as Simon, son of Jonas. Simon, flesh and blood. The name Peter was the name that was given to him by Jesus. And and Peter means the rock. The name Simon reflected what Peter was by nature. By nature, he was flesh and blood. He was an earthly, carnal man. He was Peter, however, the rock by the grace of God. Only through the grace of God was Peter, though, the rock. Here the other disciples refer to him as Simon. Simon, flesh and blood. Simon, the one who on three separate occasions had denied his Lord. See, the disciples in Jerusalem were well familiar with Simon's fall from grace. They remembered his arrogance and his self-confidence, his hollow pledge of undying faithfulness to Jesus uh, still resonated in their ears. Simon, who said, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Simon, who said, although all shall be offended, yet will not I. Uh, Simon, who had arrogantly exalted himself above his fellow disciples, Simon, who even in the face of Jesus' warning concerning the denial of him, had confidently declared, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Simon, who only hours later, though, denied his Lord three times. Confronted by the statement of a young girl in the courtyard of the high priest's home, she says to him, Uh, Thou also wast with Jesus of Nazareth. Peter responds, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And then only a short while later, another servant girl also declares, uh, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. And Peter's response has now become more forceful. He says, I do not know the man. And then it all culminated in the third occasion where another asserts, Surely thou art one of them. For thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth there too. And now Peter begins even to deny that more vehemently. We're told he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. It was to that Simon, Simon the denier of Jesus, that sometime during that Sunday, upon that Resurrection Sunday. We're not told exactly when nor where, but on that Resurrection Sunday, the risen Christ made himself known to him. No details are given in the Bible of the meeting. The only references in the Bible to it are found 
here in our text and in the passage we read in 1 Corinthians 15 this evening, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 5, where we're told and that he was seen of Cephas, another name for Peter, and that he was seen of Cephas then of the twelve. Jesus could have appeared to many others on that uh, Resurrection Sunday. He could have appeared perhaps to John, uh, the beloved disciple. He could have appeared to Thomas, who refused to believe. But no, before he appears to them, he appears to Simon. It's evident that Jesus was particularly concerned that Simon Peter should know that he had risen from the dead. Peter had featured, interestingly, in the angel's message to the women at the sepulchre. You find that in Mark 16 and verse 7. There the angel said to the women, But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall you see him, as he said unto you. There in Mark 16, verse 7, there's an indication of the special attention that Jesus Christ pays to Peter. Go tell my disciples and Peter that he goes before him into Galilee. What Jesus came to do, you see, was to assure Simon that notwithstanding his denial of him, nonetheless he had not cast him off. Jesus appeared to Simon because he loved him and he knew furthermore that Simon was hurting. We know that Simon was hurting from Matthew 26 verse 75. We read there, And Peter remembered the word of Jesus which said unto him, Before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. And then we are told that he went out and wept bitterly. Jesus, though, came to Simon to confirm to him the glorious news of the resurrection. Simon must know that Jesus had risen from the dead. And though he had denied him, and though he had vehemently, in fact, sworn an oath that he did not know him, Yet Jesus, by his very appearance to him, assured Peter that he had not been forgotten. Great sinner, though Peter was, Jesus pointed Peter to himself as the one in whom his redemption was to be found. And in his tenderness, Jesus Christ came to Peter to tell him personally and to assure him personally and to show him personally that he was risen and in so doing to assure him that all was well. Brethren, as sinners, as fellow deniers of the Lord, it should gladden our hearts that Jesus assured Peter and took the time to assure Peter that he had risen from the dead. We too need to know that Jesus has risen from the dead. We too also need to be assured of those things. The truth was that Peter's sins had actually nailed Jesus to the cross. The truth is that our sins also nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. We were responsible. Peter was responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. But death and the grave could not hold him. The Lord is risen indeed. Brethren, that's what we must embrace. That's what we must believe. That's what we must know. And so the question comes to us, do we know and embrace the reality of the resurrection? Do we know and believe that Jesus Christ died 
and rose again from the dead. Do we actually believe that Jesus Christ not only did that, but do we believe also that Jesus Christ died and rose again for us personally? That's the heart, really, of the Christian life. It's not just to know of the reality of these things, it's to know of those things as a reality for ourselves. Do we have the sense of joy that enveloped the church there in Jerusalem that first day of the week? Sometimes I think we hear these uh, great truths of things such as the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, but those things don't really excite us and thrill our hearts and minds. But when you think about it, those things ought to thrill us. It's all, it's all to do with our own salvation. The spontaneous joy that uh, led the disciples in Jerusalem to greet the two men from Emmaus with the news, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared under Simon, ought, ought to be part and parcel of, of our uh, thinking as well. But then retain cultivate a sense of such joy. It's the greatest news that sinners can ever hear. Jesus Christ is not dead. He lives. And because he lives, we will live also. Amen. Let's uh, just stand for a brief uh, word of prayer. Uh, they were heady days in which the disciples of Jesus lived and one can understand the confusion that they would have experienced. We have the benefit of being able to read all of these accounts of the different occasions on which our Lord uh, revealed himself to uh, many in the New Testament church. Our prayer is that though we personally cannot see the Saviour, that by faith we might embrace the reality of the resurrection, and that the news of the resurrection, the glorious news of the resurrection, might also stimulate our hearts and minds and it might produce within us a genuine sense of joy. This is the basis for our salvation. If Jesus Christ uh, simply died on the cross of Calvary and then was buried in Joseph's uh, sepulchre and his body remains there to this day, then we have no hope. But because Jesus Christ is risen, so also uh, we have uh, the hope of the assured hope of our own salvation and of our own resurrection. So Lord... It, uh, speak to our hearts, encourage us, us uh, take time to study uh, the detail of the scriptures of these things because in the uh, detail of the scriptures we uh, see how that through all the events that were taking place in that very short period of time you were working in the hearts of your people uh, to bring to them the assurance of the resurrection of our Saviour. Lord, uh, we uh, thank you for your word this day. And uh, we pray that we might be able to embrace and to receive it for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.